Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is D.H. Thorne here. Hopefully you can hear me okay. It's a little bit late, so I have to keep my voice down a little bit. So in my work, I have begun writing a new book. As many of you know, if you've been following along with me on Facebook or in my private groups or anything like that, you know that one of the things I'm working on currently is sort of, um, I wouldn't call it a sequel to Become the Maelstrom, but it is meant to be a companion book to it, sort of a sequel. It's going to contain a lot of things that I didn't have time to include in Become the Maelstrom, but it's also things that are meant for a little bit more of an, a little bit more advanced than Become the Maelstrom, although it's still aimed at intermediate or below. And part of what I'm working on is a system of correspondences. And that system of correspondences is my own personal one that I currently use, and it is based somewhat on the chakra system. And as part of that, I've had to develop ways of working with and understanding chakra that worked for me, and that also meant delving reasonably deep into the subject as other people talk about it. And in that process, I'm kind of going around a lot of bases here, in that process, I also learned some new things about myself and about my practices. You know, that's why being a teacher and being an author is so great because you're not just writing books and making money and looking cool and all this other stuff. You really have to refine your abilities and knowledge and you have to be able to define them and communicate them. And if you can do that, you can really learn them. And communication is the point of this video. In most chakra system, including my own, the throat chakra, now of course some of you may already know what I think of chakra. Chakra are a thought form that we install into a center of vitality or awareness, a, a site of manifestation. But the throat chakra in all systems has some correspondences with basically the idea of expression. And there's more to it than that. I don't want to simplify it. But the throat chakra is about expression. And it's easy to know that. It's easy to, to read that and say the throat chakra is about expression. If you work on your throat chakra, you'll be better at speaking. And sometimes my throat chakra is overactive. That's why I talk too much. At least that would be the diagnosis for someone who was doing energy work for me. Thorne's throat chakra is overactive. That's why he never shuts up. That's why he cuts people off. That's, that's pretty true. But in my development of this system and seeing just how amazingly well it interlocks and corresponds to the trinity of self that I created based on a lifetime of work with that symbolism, not knowing how well that the chakra system, the seven chakra system, corresponded to the trinity of self. I had no idea until I really started breaking it down. And I found how it works. And it makes perfect sense to me now. And because of that, I had a bit of an epiphany. And part of that came while working with one of my students in my mentorship program. We were talking about how to develop our astral sense to be able to communicate with a spirit verbally, visually, etc. And so this rapidly turned into something I was working on the night before, and a few days before, actually. That's what started the conversation, because we were chatting, to give you some of the backstory, we were chatting about things on Facebook, and we were talking about some experiences we were having, and I was sharing them with this person so that they would understand, and they're making really awesome progress with a particular spirit. I'm really proud of their progress. Uh, you know who you are if you're listening. <laughs> Dan Talion and you are doing well together. If during this conversation it occurred to me certain things, and I started working with Balam of all spirits, uh, because Balam is of the Goetic entities. He's one of the best at helping you with divination, scrying, basically all of your third eye awareness. And so I worked with Balam one night in meditation, and I had uh, I had my uh, astral sight you know, my astral chakra audio playing with the binaural beat, and I meditated for a while with incense and a 
I actually use an oil lamp instead of a candle for a change. And I bless the oil for him and all that. And it was really cool because I actually started getting some really vivid visualizations and I really began to hear him very clearly. And not that I can't normally. It's just that this was, this was cool because it was like, it was just something better about it than usual. And as good as that was, I realized that it wasn't really that much better than what I usually get. And then I started thinking, I started realizing things. I started realizing that people have this obsession with seeing spirits and hearing them in their mind and then talking to them with their spiritual voice, if you will, intoning to them with their spiritual voice. And that is important. But that's really actually less effective and less natural than we realize. Now, let me clarify. My whole life, when I work with spirits, my ability to visualize and hear them is not, you know, necessarily better than anybody else's. Um, I don't see elaborate visions and I don't see the spirits as clearly as some people can. I don't have very good visualization skills compared to some people. I'm a more of a verbal thinker than most people. I can visualize, and I'm sure you've heard me say this many times, but I tend to, when I visualize, it's a quick flash and it's gone. So having something stay in my mental vision, let alone in my physical vision, is, is a little bit unlikely. It can happen. It does happen. But it's not as regular as I would like sometimes. And I realize there's a reason for that. And, and I'm going to try to explain this so you understand. So I'm going to go around some bases here. Hopefully I make sense by the time I'm done talking. So follow along slowly, write down notes, whatever you got to do. We're gonna, I don't have this scripted. I'm going to be just kind of rambling on. What you think of as vision, as sight, be it spiritual, astral sight, or your eyeball sight, is based upon an integration of body and spirit. So if we look at the trinity of self, especially if you're looking in Become the Maelstrom, we're looking at the trinity of self as that triangle where you have mind, body, and spirit, the holistic trinity. The spirit is form without substance. And the body is substance without form. And the mind overlays these two truths to create an visceral reality that we can see, feel, touch, taste, experience fully. On the body end of the spectrum, in the chakra system, we're talking about everything from the sacral down. The mind is the sacral, the heart, and the throat. And these are the three centers of manifestation. That's important. The spirit is the throat, the third eye, and the crown. And it's in that order. The most bodily of the bodily chakra is the root. The most spiritual is the crown. The most mind is the heart. So this is all very important. When you start to understand that reality, as you understand it, exists in the material plane, and the dream experience is experienced in the astral plane, but it's part of the mental part of the astral plane, you start to realize that the spiritual aspect, the astral plane, being a realm of form without substance has to be invisible. Now, what do I mean by that? The only reason that you can see something is because light is bounced off of it in some way. Whatever your theory of what light is, whether you think it's, you know, uh, an etheric field of waves, you know, going back to Tesla and, and the non aristotelian particle version of light, or if you use the, the quantum physics version of light where it's a particle, no matter how you look at it, it is a, a reflection or a absorption and refraction or absorption and, and whatever of light coming into your eye. And in order for that to work, you have to have a substance. So if the astral world, where the spirits reside, and when I say reside, I mean that is where they are focused. Okay, That is where their their consciousness is focused. Unlike us that's focused more on the material, they're focused more in the astral realm. 
they reside and communicate in the astral realm. And the astral realm is on the spiritual part of the Trinity, which means it has no physicality to it. And if there is no physicality to it, that means there's no substance there. There's no atoms, there's no molecules necessarily. And if there are, they are more like just pure energy that doesn't have any kind of visible component to it. To give you an example, when you look at the waves on an ocean, the waves would be invisible to you if there wasn't an ocean there. Sound waves are invisible to your eyes, aren't they? It's the same theory, it's the same principle. Sound waves are generally invisible to your eyes, and if you can see them all, it's because there's like a compression wave or something that goes with it. So, you can't see energy. You can't see formless, I mean, excuse me, form-only objects. So you can put it in more context. Let's say you are fully in the spiritual, fully. You're not dreaming, you're in a fully spiritual state. There's no material substance to it at all. The form of a cube is an invisible box. It is a emptiness, and in this emptiness, you just know a box exists, but it has no, no visible walls to it. It's the idea of a box without there being one. Now the same thing applies not just to visual things, but audible things. The idea of words, the idea of sounds. They require a physical medium, a, a material medium, a substance in order for them to exist as sound, in order for you to receive the vibration in your inner ear and turn that into wom 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 sound. Some of you can already see where I might be going with this. Probably not. If you are the type of person who has been taught your entire life to believe that the third eye is the ability to see things that aren't there normally. If you've been taught that spirits communicate in words and pictures only, I think you've been mistaken as I was. So this is kind of a correction video to anything I might have said before. I now understand that human beings have a handicap, a hang up, in that we are trapped in the material world so much in our thinking that we think the spirits communicate to us in apparitions when they are not that. In other words, talking to a spirit with our voice is a very immature, a very unevolved, inefficient method of communication for them. This would be like sending smoke signals when you have a cell phone in your hand. Imagine that. Now, how do I know this? The throat chakra, which is the chakra or awareness or center or whatever you like to call it. Until you read my book, you might get a different opinion about what to call it. The throat center is about expression and that involves being clear, making decisions, etc. Being expressive, being able to express yourself. Now, interestingly enough, the throat being closer to the spiritual realm is actually very inefficient for communicating in the material world. And this is why things like words, things like the internet where you're just typing what you're thinking without context or emotional content, things like body language can be so confusing and easily distorted into something they don't mean to represent. Because you are literally taking a spiritual thing, the throat, manifesting with it in the material world and in so doing 
it's an imperfect translation. There's going to be problems. They're not perfectly lined up. So they can be easily misunderstood. Now, here's where it gets fun. I've often wondered, how is it that I know so much without always hearing voices? People say, well, don't you talk to spirits? Yes, I've had conversations with them in my mind. And they always seemed like I had to pick and choose parts that were just my imagination and parts that were real. As a somewhat skeptical person, I'm careful about that. Not many people are. They'll just believe whatever the fuck they hear in their mind. And then you'll have people who are saying, well, you're not that powerful if you don't hear them in your mind and blah, blah, blah. Okay. And these are the people who have these off-the-wall ideas that are usually wrong. <laughs> the superstitious types, I guess you could say. Then you have someone like me, and I'm not the only one. In fact, most of you would think are like this. You just don't realize it. In communication with the spirit, you will suddenly just know something. You'll just know. Yes, you'll see things. Yes, you'll hear things. But you might hear a word or see a picture in your mind, but your brain is suddenly filled with this entire new spectrum of ideas or memories, as I prefer to think of them, because most of the time spirits trigger memories in our brain. That's one of the easiest ways they can communicate with us. But sometimes you just suddenly have a fully formed understanding of something when they want to give it to you. It's inspiration. It comes to you as inspired knowledge, gnosis. That is the evolved form of the throat chakra's communication because the throat chakra, the throat, this part of our energy body, this part of our awareness is most efficient in the astral realm. It's actually more efficient, more accurate, more precise in that realm. And when we're trying to communicate in that realm, we don't need to use the material version of it, such as words, such as pictures, sounds, any of that crap. All of that is material. That is based on a materialistic view of reality. You only think you need to hear the sound or speak the words because you don't realize that the material reality is just one vibration of the delusion. And it goes all the way up to non-physicality. It hasn't quite reached your mind yet that you can just express things to spirits instantly and vice versa. And the proof for that is the way people will tell you that so many spirits will just know what's in your heart without you having to say it. Think about it. Most people in the material world have very little control over what they express. And what I mean by that is as an empath, someone who can read body language subconsciously, I just know what you mean. And we all do this, but some of us do it better than others. As an empath who can read you like a book sometimes just by how you type what you're typing. I read the patterns differently than you do. It's like I can smell a smell you can't or see a color you can't. It's weird. Doesn't mean I'm always right about things. It just means that I get an idea of things better than you do. Now, what is that? Well, that is because you, on average, the average person doesn't block they don't know that they're expressing themselves. It's like someone who gets nervous, they can't help from sweating and from, you know, all kinds of things. In a similar vein, the vast majority of people are unaware or incapable of being aware that they express themselves subconsciously constantly. Some of us are a little bit more aware and we carefully craft what we do. Some of us are so paranoid that we're a wall. And I, I work with people like that. I know a lot of people like that. It's, it's actually, as an empath, it's frustrating to hit a wall because a person who's really good at shielding, it's a lot harder to figure out. And we feel blind. You'll actually see that happen to me. And I've come to grips with that recently. I finally started to realize that was my problem. Some people are just so good at shielding their emotions and, they're, and that doesn't mean because they're magical. It just means maybe they were abused and showing emotion and showing what they were really thinking was a no-no. 
So some people are really good at putting up a wall and you can't read them for shit. And when an empath like me gets around a person like that, we it's almost like having both arms tied behind our back because we're used to counting on that information. So when I encounter a person like that, I can get totally stymied and not know what you're thinking, not know what you're saying, and I, can, I can't figure out what's going on and I'm, I'm like an idiot, you know? <laughs> I'm like a bat with his mouth sewn shut. I, I just can't do it. So it, I realize now that this idea that we need to be able to communicate with spirits in a verbal, visceral way is a flaw in our own ascension, a flaw in our mind, a flaw in our thinking. It is an entertaining way to do it. I'm not saying don't do it. That's That would be wrong too. That would be eliminating an entire spectrum of experience, and I'm not suggesting you do that. All I'm suggesting is that you open yourself to the idea that just because you can't see, hear, or some other way experience the spirits in a visceral way doesn't mean that they're not getting through to you. If your third eye is properly functioning, you will at first experience more synchronicity You'll experience more meaningful coincidences. You'll experience um, omens and symbols. You'll notice things you didn't notice before in your environment. Maybe you'll notice occult symbols. Maybe you'll notice words coming out of people's mouths. You know, you'll notice re repetitive words will be popping up in your experience. You know, for some reason the word triangle just keeps popping up. You don't know why. Then you see my book with the Trinity of Self on the cover. Something like that weird stuff like that. You'll be hearing words all the time. Wow, that's weird. You're the th third person this week that talked about the movie, you know, The Last Starfighter. Why is that? <laughs> that's weird. Did you all watch the same commercial or something and you're all talking about it? So, you'll notice those kinds of things. You'll also start to trust your intuition more because you'll be able to discern what's intuition and what's just wishful thinking or petty fear and anxiety, you'll, you'll start to learn the difference. When your third eye is functioning, you start to notice patterns in your experience that are more valuable than others. You'll also, when you are visualizing, you'll be able to tell when you're just imagining something versus when it has meaning. Uh, to give you an example, tonight when I was driving with my wife, uh, she was driving, as she usually does at night because I have a little bit of trouble uh, because of astigmatism, I have really good night vision, but that's actually a bad thing because it can really screw me up, and I'm not really my, the best driver in the world, so that's, that's, that's a funny thing about me. So I usually, unfortunately, she has to drive, which kind of sucks for her. So she was driving somewhere tonight, and while we were driving, I was kind of nodding off because I, I, I keep weird hours now, and I'm, i got to fix that a little bit, and I'm getting kind of weird at night where I, I just, it's like always sleep time for me if I want it to be. I can just nod off. And I was kind of nodding off in the car, and we were stopped at a light, and I knew we were at a light. I was like half awake and half asleep. And in my half awake, half asleep dream, I saw like a, a truck cut us off at the light and scare us. And I knew this was just a dream. And as I'm watching this in my dream, I hear, burr, burr. well, a truck behind us honked its horn, and I realized that was some kind of premonition I, I kind of knew something like that was going to have it was really kind of cool and I'm like well it wasn't very useful <laughs> it didn't translate into a behavioral change for me but I noticed it I, saw, I thought to myself why there's no way I would know there's a truck behind us I was dead asleep I didn't hear anything it wasn't a, it wasn't an 18 wheeler it was just a pickup truck but it had the big horns on it so it was really weird so my point is you'll pick up on these little weird things more and more and more but the misconception people have is that when your third eye is open, it will be more like a Hollywood movie where you see special effects everywhere. That's absolutely not my experience at all whatsoever. It seems like the more open my third eye feels, the more intuitive, the more aware I become, the less I rely on being able to see or hear anything, the more I just intuitively know things. The more I'm just, I get it. 
The third eye is your spiritual perception, just as your sacral is your bodily perception. And the heart is your personal perception, your personal awareness of what you're really about, what you really think, what, what is really happening with you at the moment is your heart. So your third eye isn't mental vision sight. It isn't just that. It's not, I've often said that the third eye is one half imagination, and now I understand what I meant. That imagination is your interface between what's really happening. And it's actually more like training wheels. When it's really working, you don't even need your imagination. You don't need to visualize to have a receptive communication. And you don't need to verbalize in the spirit world at all. And so what ends up happening is this push that so many people have to make their spiritual communication more like what we experience when we're face to face, that's actually an indication, if anything, that you've got more work to do than you realize. It's almost like a trap. It's almost like the ancients knew by pushing you in this direction that you have to be able to see and hear and feel the spirit so viscerally, and those are the ones who are advanced, that they would be the ones who kind of hit a, a wall of capability. I'm wondering about that. And again, that isn't to say that that's wrong. I think it's, I think it's actually valuable, a valuable experience to have that experience. I think it's very valuable to see, hear, and feel the spirits on a visceral level. But let's not confuse that with the spirit world. <clears throat> let's not confuse the visceral experience of a spirit for the spirit world, especially since I know from channeling, from working with them, from doing all this stuff, that I know the spirit world is completely, maybe not completely, but is nearly completely devoid of all visceral sensation, if not all visceral sensation. And by visceral sensation, I mean, you can have the experience of fire in the astral realm without being burned. You can, you can have pain without it hurting you. You can see light without it blinding you. It's like it's, it's muted. It's like a dream, you know, like I say to people a lot of times, if you hurt yourself in a dream, you rarely feel it, really. You, you might be aware of it, but it's nothing like what the real pain would be like. It's very muted, you know, it's, unless you're like in your sleep, crunk your arm the wrong way and it hurts, you're not going to feel much. You'll just, you'll just be aware of it. Maybe you'll feel a snap. It'll just feel wrong, but it's not going to, it's not going to hurt. That's a clue. That's a clue about the spirit realm. And this is why so many people in antiquity and in different various spiritual cultures felt like the material world was down on the bottom and the spirit world went up into the heavens. And the material world was more firm and hard and the, the further down you went, the hotter and firmer it got. And the higher you went, the colder, bluer and emptier it got. But somewhere in the middle was like this astral realm where spirits flew and planets floated and you could have heavens and hells floating around in these places. And that's true. But I've come to the conclusion that even the dream world, both ends of it, the sleeping dream is on the astral side of our mental state. The waking dream is on the material side of our waking state. We're awake in both states. It's just one is the body's asleep. And so we are cut off from that material side because the body is the, the avatar for us to experience physical reality through. And when it's shut off or dead, we don't stop. We're still here, but we've lost all physical connection. And if there is any sense of physicality left, it will be like a sleeping dream, if there is any at all. There may be truth to the idea that the afterlife is total blackness. But it will be the blackness of the blind. So you won't see blackness because blackness is still something you can see. It will be a total utter lack of visual aspect. However, you will fully know everything as if it was seen and felt. You will just be aware. 
And I can't put it any better than that because I've never been there. <laughs> I don't know what that's like. But that's my speculation. Anyway, guys, I hope this video was helpful to you. If you don't agree with what I'm saying, if you think Thor and you're just nuts, you're going completely the wrong direction now. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting too caught up in your own head. I've seen spirits. I know that's more real than what I just think, you know, whatever. Leave me a comment. That's fine. Just be respectful about it. If you agree with me, tell me why you think so. And uh, if you like my content, make sure you like, share, and subscribe. And if you're interested in supporting my work even further, in the description are links to where you can buy my books, uh, as well as my Patreon. And I will be announcing very soon, for those of you who are staying around this long, um, another batch of mentorship slots will be opening up in March. Uh, this first month has gone really well. Expect another announcement about that very soon. And uh, look for that. It'll probably be another six people I'll take. Depends on how much time I can clear out of my schedule. So anyway, guys, thanks for watching. Mind the shadows.